Good evening and welcome tonight to our meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know. I am Richard Rubin, a member of the Commonwealth Board of Governors, Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors, and your chair for this program. You can find us on the internet at commonwealthclub.org or download the iPhone and Android apps for the programs and you can schedule and for schedule information and podcasts of all of our uh, past programs as well. Let me mention that tonight's program is part of the club's Good Lit series that has been underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. We thank them very, very much. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Maurice Canbar, noted inventor, philanthropist, and author of, the, author of the newly updated version of his 2001 book, Secrets from an Inventor's Notebook. I am also very pleased to call Maurice a good friend. Long before there was the TV series Shark Tank, there was Maurice Canbar. Maurice has been called a modern Buckminster Fuller, and he has accumulated over 41 patents, 41, in four decades of inventing. His creations include the Defuzz It Sweater Comb, a customizable sticky notes device called Zip Notes, Sky Vodka, and its successor, Blue Angel, they're both very good. The first nation's first multiplex movie theaters, which happen to be in New York City. Durable eyeglasses, which he donates, 50,000 or more as I recall, and going up, to people in developing countries. Very extra safe children's toys. Organically manufactured foods. A caviar and much, much more. In 2006, Maurice actually produced his first feature film. Maybe some of you saw it. It was the animated film called Hoodwinked, followed by Hoodwinked 2, its sequel, Hood versus Evil. Maurice is also well known for his charitable contributions from the Canbar Cardiac Center at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco, to New York University's Canbar Film School, to the internationally renowned San Francisco Girls Chorus, whose Performing Arts Center on Page Street bears his name. Maurice was born and reared in Brooklyn. His roots were not wealthy ones. His parents owned a small laundry. He had to make it on his own, and he early on learned the value of saving. For example, Maurice never worries about paying large sums to go into parking lots. Why? Well, you could see him instead riding around on his trademark red scooter all around town. Doesn't take up that lot of space. Some years ago, Maurice told an interviewer about a Charlie Chaplin film that he particularly liked, which was entitled Limelight. At one point, the great actor who is then only a young boy in the film, is walking past a toy shop. And he exclaims to his father, hey dad, look at that wonderful toy, knowing that they could not possibly afford it. Chaplin's father looks at the boy in the film, points to his head, and says, this is the greatest toy ever given man. Maurice never forgot that and today we are the better for it. He has gone on to write his own story several times over. His energy and enthusiasm, frankly, are contagious. Maurice holds a degree in engineering from Philadelphia University, which also awarded him an honorary degree, along with another that he received from Kenyon College in Ohio, which it just so happens is my own alma mater. He has quite clearly put his education to good use. Today, Maurice will be in conversation with Dr. Mary Bitterman, who is past chair of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors, president of the Bernard Osher Foundation, and the chair of the PBS Foundation. Would you please give a rousing welcome to Maurice Canbar, a truly Renaissance man.
this point, you'd say genug ist genug. Genug, genug, you know. That was genug such means. a gracious yeah. introduction, but every piece of it so so well scripted and so true. The thing I want to start off with is, and I should disclose the fact that I know you. Yes. All right. Um, there's something about your upbringing and I think sort of a moat around you of a certain kind of unconditional love, which I think principally was directed to you by your mother who thought you were perfection completed. I don't Do you know. want to just say a word about what it was like growing up in Brooklyn? Your parents have a small laundry. You have two brothers, Elliot, one of my yeah, favorite names, Ed, Elliot yeah. and Edward. And so, say a well, word was, about Brooklyn. Uh, well, Brooklyn was a beautiful place. Uh, my first job at the age of 12 was working in a drugstore because I was a small, skinny kid. And I didn't want to work at the supermarket because I have to carry big packages and help older people. This way here, prescription was somebody to put in my pocket, <laughs> deliver it, and in those Did days- Did you ride a scooter then? No, a bicycle. No. I pedaled okay. a bike. And if you got a nickel tip, that was going fine. If you got a dime tip, that was a big tipper. There was one guy that gave a quarter tip. Oh my gosh. And that was a lot of money, and I couldn't wait for him to get sick again, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So it was, it, was, it was really lovely. And my parents, who were, were not Orthodox Jews, decided the best school to send me to was a yeshiva. And I hated it, hated it at the time, but today I realize that was a very wonderful thing that they did. I didn't like it because I had to get in at 8.30 till 4.30 when the other kids went to school from 9 to 3. Well, why do I have to? Anyway, it worked out. It was a wonderful Did your thing. brothers go to the yeshiva as oh, well? Oh, yeah. Three of us yeah. went to yeshiva. And, and you see, again, they were very dedicated to making sure that their kids are going to go to college out of town. And again, it was just as expensive then as it is now, even though it was only $2,000 a year. Well, the subway fare was a nickel. It's yeah. now $2.50. Yeah, and a big tip was 10 cents. Of, yeah. of what's happened you know, to the value of money. And, but we all went, they all did very well at school. My brothers did better than I did. Uh, but yeah, that is for grades, you know. But, but I've always, you know, had a little uh, inventive uh, or maybe if I needed to get something, I would do it. Like my, I would say, somebody said, what was your first invention? I said, the kid next door in Brooklyn, his mother bought him a bow and arrow. And I said, Mommy, I'd like to have a bow and arrow. I'm like 12. There's no bow and arrows. No, forget it. We don't, they, don't, they never bought me toys. So I said, God, I want a bow and arrow. So we had a little backyard with some trees, and I looked for a long, straight branch. I cut the branch, tied a piece of string, bent it over, made my own bow and arrow, OK? Hey, now I can play. And I had, look, I got it. I think it was working better than his purchased <laughs> bow and arrow. So. Things like that, I think, start at a very young age. I mean, my brothers didn't have it, but, you know, I did. You so were just always I've been, curious. I've been blessed. I think, well, again, I've been blessed. It's not that I work harder. It's that, you know, things come to me. I'll explain it when I explain some of these things. Because it isn't a matter of working hard. It's a matter of doing the right thing, the right sequences. And being inquisitive. And being inquisitive. Well, constantly. As a matter of what, you know, I asking think questions. If you look at a two year old and you want to determine the two year old's IQ, how do you do that? You measure curiosity. You show him something, you see how long is the kid involved? And, he, la, 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 you know? <laughs> and then you convert that to IQ. So if you have the curiosity, you will certainly learn. If you don't have the curiosity, then okay, everything's okay. Yeah. Anyway. I think uh, it's wonderful that you've brought some demonstrations. Yeah. Now, the people on radio will not be able to see these things, but, okay, but we'll try, to describe, try to describe them describe so well so, yeah. that they'll feel 
Okay, a well, tactile here, sensation. We here. want to begin with the defuzzer. Okay, well, this is my How first... How did this come about? This is my first invention, okay? I was at a uh, dude ranch with my college roommate, and I, my, I was wearing a sweater, and my back was against a concrete wall. And he said, come on down to the bar. There's some very nice girls that I've seen. I was no, come on. And he pulled me. And as, as he pulled me, I looked at the... I said, wait a minute. And I saw two fuzzballs on the concrete. I said, what the hell is going on here? You know? Well, I said, forget it. Go. I'm not going. And I thought about it. And I said, I realized what had happened, that the sand in the concrete was able to grab one of the fuzzballs on my sweater and took it right off. So I, when I went home, I, got some, I bought some coarse fabric, a quarter of a yard. And then I bought some adhesive. And I put the adhesive on and then sprinkled sand over it. Basically, it's almost like sandpaper. And I waited for it to dry and then folded it. And lo and behold, on a sweater, it removed the fuzzballs. And the ones that were not too tight, it opened the fuzzballs. Now, there's a difference. Some of these new fuzzball removers cut the fuzzballs off. What happens eventually is that the loft, the fibers that stick out, are all cut, and the cashmere doesn't have the same soft feel. But with defuzz it, you know what I mean? I, and I put that right here. We originally, it cost us seven cents to make this with the card, and we sold it for a dollar. So we made about 40, 50 cents for each one we sold. I didn't have much money. What we did was we took two of these and mailed it to Notion stores and said, we are a small company. We can't afford to send a representative to see you, but we think we have a nice product. And cut along the dotted line and send this order, three dozen, six dozen, 12 dozen. And we got orders. And the reason why I said cut along the dotted line, because to perforate that, they wanted $60. Oh, <laughs> forget it. Okay. So I said cut along the dotted line. And the first 14 months, we made $220,000. At a time, at that point, the subway fare in New York was 10 cents. It's now 250, so that's 25 times. $220,000 was like making $2 million. It was fabulous, okay? I bought a house on 77th Street between 5th and Madison for $247,000, 25 foot limestone building. It's worth I don't know, $20 million, mind-boggling. Anyway, so that was my first invention. I finally decided to go on, you know, so I sold this to the kid that I invited to come in. He lost his job. Anyway, he's, he's still making money because I got involved with some other things. Anyway. Why don't uh, we talk huh? a little bit about, and it's very interesting, and um, I recommend this book to all of you okay. who want to go into the innovation business. Maurice is very clear about asking questions, thinking about whether or not what you want to do sort of makes sense. But naming and branding is extremely important. Your okay. quad cinema. And you have to remember that Maurice Canbar is really in earlier lives was obviously a filmmaker. He obviously owned studios all over the world. He led a life so rich in film because now in this iteration of his life, he's been so involved with film societies. He goes to Cannes every year. He's produced films. He has endowed the film school at NYU. And he's done this wonderful program for KQED called oh, yeah. Film School Shorts where right some extraordinary films from nine exceedingly prestigious film schools are um, curated and presented across the United States to PBS member stations, including 30 of the major markets. So say a word about how you decided to come up with Quad Cinema. OK, well, I, I was having dinner with somebody who came from Chicago. And he was telling me his grandfather built some wonderful movie houses, and the movie business was now terrible, and this is 1971. So I said, gee, I go to the movies all the time. I don't understand. Well, he says people are watching television and whatnot. 
Anyway, so I walked into uh, actually Lowe's 85th Street. It was a 1,500-seat house. And I counted the house. There was 120 people there. I said, my God, the poor guy is going broke. But I made a determination that people in the movie business, the exhibition business, did not really understand. And that was things had gotten worse in terms of people paying to come to the movies, but some people still wanted to go to the movies. Well, I realized, I said, whatever, you show a film, so many warm bodies will show up. They don't care how big the theater was. It's a long story. I accidentally owned some property on 13th Street in Manhattan. And I said, you know, we, I could build 450 seat houses. And if each one pulls 100 people, I'm doing great. Anyway, I did that. And it worked beautifully. And we were profitable the first month. And everybody looked at this and said, that's right. You know, you don't have to build a big 1,500 seat house. Or if you have a 1,500 seat, you go broke. But then let's see if we can cut it up and make it into small. But nobody thought of building four little movie houses under one roof. So there it was. And to me, once you think about it, it's not, I didn't think it was brilliant. I said, I made a determination. You know what I mean? Show a film, so many warm bodies will show up. Because going to a theater is an event. And I always say, look, it has something to do with sex. What does it have to do with sex? I mean, look. The guy wants Mary to stay over tonight. So he calls her up and he says, hi, sweetheart, I got a great film on DVD. Come on over. He says, forget it, I'm not doing it. He says, listen, Mary, I'll take you for a hamburger and we're going to see a movie. Then we can go home. He says, okay. <laughs> Hello? I mean, what? It's not rocket science, okay? Okay. okay. We still... We still now, before have Maurice people. makes yeah. everything sound just so elementary and so <laughs> simple that any one of us in this room and anyone in the audience could come up with these uh, very smart ideas, well, let me just ask you to say a few words about 8020. Oh, come on. All right, well, now, not everything that I've done was a big hit. I mean, I have had. A few, but uh, you know, one I'll give you, which I thought was going to be fabulous. I didn't do my homework. Okay. Anyway, uh, I, I had a young lady who said, I'm, uh, I, had a, I did a favor. She said, I'm taking you to lunch. I said, OK. It was Sunday. She takes me to lunch. She drives into a Burger King. I said, I don't want a burger. What is this? This is lunch? She says, oh, Sunday. The rest of them are closed. Oh, come on out. I follow her into Burger King. It's my first time Burger King. She says, order the chicken McNuggets. <coughs> oh, chicken tenders. McNuggets is from uh, Mc McDonald's. Anyway, I said, okay, so what do you want to drink? I said, I want to drink uh, Diet Coke because I want to cut down on my sugar intake. He says, okay. I'm saying, what is it, sir? I said, I want a Diet Coke. I got an empty cup. He says, over there. I said, okay. I didn't know what the routine was. <laughs> and I said, Carolyn, look at this. This is America. Regular Coke, Diet Coke, Sprite, yeah. Schmite, uh, Dr. Pepper, Mrs. Jackson, whatever. I said, you have choices. I said, wait a minute, let me try this. I said, I want Diet Coke. Okay. I put in about 20% regular Coke, sugar Coke, and 80% Diet Coke, stirred it. And I said, Carolyn, look at this. You can't taste the aspartame. This tastes perfectly like it's 100% sugar. And I said, boy, I went home, I did, I bought diet, I bought regular diet, I was mixing. I said, this is a great item. I said, I've got it. We're going to make 80-20 cola. I said, great. There was a, a very sharp kid, the son of a friend of mine. I said, Russ, I said, I'm going to hire him. He, was he, he just run for office and lost. Anyway, he said, yeah, I'm a very, <laughs> very sharp kid. So I said, okay, Russ, we're going to do this, blah, blah. And I didn't do my homework, okay? We showed it to Safeway. Safeway says, we're going to give you a corner, you know, d display. It's terrific. We love it. What a great idea, 80, 20 gold. We did it, and then I got to study what was really happening. I said, wait a minute. On a six-pack of Coca-Cola, diet or otherwise, Coke makes 12 cents. I thought they'd make a dollar, so I can make a half a dollar. You know? I said, that was the first bad thing. And then 80, 20 cola could not be patented. Okay, I said, Russ, you know, I made a big mistake. First, there's not enough money profit. Secondly, I said, if we're successful, 
at Safeway, you can be sure that Coke and Pepsi are going to knock us off, and we won't have a chance to compete. So all I can tell you is I'm closing it down. I'll take a whatever two hundred fifty three hundred thousand dollar loss. I'm going to give you a month, and that's it. The, the end. So the end of the story was he said to me, you know, came back two days later. He said, you know, I'd, I'd like to make a, an energy energy drink. I said that's a very good idea because same eight ounce thing they get two dollars. Red Bull gets two dollars. Sure. And by that time he understood the business that you can get contract people to make whatever you want, okay? You can make an energy drink with caffeine, taurine, whatever. You can make it and make it taste better, make it taste better than Red Bull. I said, you got to get a good name, Ross, because to me, your name is very important. I got a great name. I said, what? He said, my name is Rockstar. Rockstar energy drink. I said, Rockstar? Who the hell wants to drink a Rockstar? <laughs> okay? So I didn't invest. I said, no, I'll help you, whatever you want, blah, blah. I said, good luck. No, it's a great name. People love Rockstar. I don't, I don't know. I don't like that. I said, well, to make a long story short, he turned down an offer of $1 billion for the brand. <laughs> So that's how smart I am. I don't <laughs> so anyway, uh, you don't hit home runs, but you can't be discouraged. No, but you have I, to continue. There's a wonderful part in, in Maurice's book where he's talking about naming, and, and you've really got to brand things properly. He, he was reflecting on something he had read that in 1909, a hair product came out, the first hair dyeing product, and it was called French Harmless hair dye. <laughs> but within a year, the company decided they would rebrand and it was called L'Oreal. So the point that, that, Bert, yeah. that, um, that, that Maurice is, is making is that, you know, here you knew that the product was not just safe, but, but glamorous. I think that's really very sweet. Now, well. what you have to know as just some background, Maurice feels very strongly that you need to ask yourself these questions as you go into the inventive process. Is what you want to bring to market more environmentally friendly or durable? Is it less costly or time consuming? Is it safer or easier to use? Is it smaller or quieter? Is it more comfortable or attractive? So with that in mind, can you say a few words about that which was initially called roll it? Uh, it was called roll it, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, look, if I get a little upset about something, I think about it. I got down to the last four pages of post-it notes, and I'm blowing out, which are finally separated. So, and I said to myself, there's got to be a better way to do post-it notes than these stupid little pads. So I thought about it. I said, wait a minute. I got it. I'm going to put post-it notes on a roll and have it delivered electrically, very simple. And I called it Roll It. So anyway, 3M, they own, uh, they own post-it notes. They said, you can't use the word Roll It. I said, why? It is our name. I said, don't be crazy. So they go to court. We had a judge. No, but didn't you do something like Post it? No, roll it. No, no, I, the reason why I called it roll it is I was going to say, don't post it, roll it. <coughs> I think that's probably it what I said to the a little bit. Yeah. So we go to court. <laughs> so we go to court, and the judge looks at me and says, you know, they don't post it. You want to call it roll it? I, don't. I said, Your Honor, in 1962, I did this, my first invention, and I called it defuzz it. So if anybody owns it, it's me. <laughs> he was that. He was that. I don't want. I don't want to talk about. But this would you judgment. like to demonstrate this yeah, well, to yeah. the so, audience? And as well, you're yeah. demonstrating, no, explain so that radio audience people feel okay, that they're well, with us right here. It's on a roll. The adhesive is in the center. You press a button, and the motor lets you take it out. And since the adhesive is in the middle. You know how post-it note curls, this lays flat. And if you want if you want a shorter piece, just say, Harry, call me. I don't want to use a three by, whoops. Anyway, there it is. 
And again, you can move it, put it over here. You know, it's a, it's a, well, I won't say, it's a sticky note, okay? But it works so easily. I have it on my desk, I use it all the time, just press a button, tear it off, okay? And you can anyway, have a so, really long piece. So I said to if you want, if you, want. If you have what we call a Megillah, I mean, you know, hey. You could write Evangeline okay. if you wanted okay, to. Okay, there it is. And here we'll put this on the back of my card here. Sticks perfectly, you know. So it's an efficient and inexpensive way because most of the time you don't want to use a three by three note. So if you use a one and a half by three note, you're saving 50%. And post-it notes are not cheap. They're like at least a penny, a three by three, each piece. And then the guys were doing some, they, they stopped it, but the pads, they sell five pads. And you look clever, all of a sudden the pad is 90 sheets instead of 100 sheets per pad. I, I don't know, I don't do things like that. But anyway, so I, th I thought that this was a good thing. The judge says to me, well, I don't know. You may have done this. I'm real crazy. He says, <laughs> I would like to listen to, no, I'm, I'm not going to dismiss their suit against you. You can't use roll it because I want to listen to some uh, expert witnesses to tell me. What it is. <laughs> I said, Your Honor, they will hire an expert witness who will tell you there's tremendous confusion. I will hire a witness and say, there's no confusion, okay? because I pay an expert witness who will do that. I says, you will make the ultimate decision. He didn't like me. He says, no, I want to listen. <laughs> I want to listen to the expert witness. And to make a long story short, sure, rather than go to court forever, they wrote a check out for him. It's a nice summer. I said, all right, I'll drop the name, roll it. I'll call it Zip Notes. And that's what I have. And it's called Zip Notes. And, uh, I'd love to find somebody who can go out there and sell it. I don't have the time. I have, See, um, that's the problem. Well, anyway, you don't okay. have the time. I know you're just should in... sell itself. Okay, I want to go into just a couple of more things, and okay. then we're going to ref we're going to raise people's questions because okay. people really want to do what you're doing. Go sure. and to do it as successfully. All right, and then once hugely successful, then they can be a munificent benefactor. Why not? Like you. I, okay, so I, it's wonderful. I want to get on to the business of saying to oneself, I want to have a little alcoholic content, but I don't want to have a headache. So why don't you share that story that led to the okay. invention of Sky, S-K-Y-Y. -Y. Okay, yeah, okay. that's, uh, it's, Again, it's common sense in my book. I didn't, see, I didn't think this was rocket science. Anyway, I, I, I went to my yearly physical, it was years like 91 or 92, and my doctor says, well, you don't look well, what, 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 don't you feel well? I said, I have a hangover. He said, what were you drinking? I said, I was drinking very good cognac. He said, stay away from cognac, just drink vodka. I said, why, just drink vodka. Said, okay, he said, you're okay. So I switched to vodka. Now, I like to have a drink, I like the buzz, and, you know, I, I'm not an alcoholic, but I like the buzz. I had a martini for lunch, you know, I have a martini for lunch. I didn't have another drink, I said, I'm one, one. anyway, so I got this headache. So, so, and now I switch to vodka, and lo and behold, <coughs> I only get a headache like one of four, one of five, one of five times, but not every time as I do with cognac. That was interesting. And then about six months later, I'm having dinner with my doctor, who happens to be a personal friend, my internist. We we're celebrating a friend's birthday. We were at a restaurant in New York. And I said, just give me a vodka on the rocks, because I found that it didn't matter what brand. One out of four times, I'd get a headache. Anyway, so the guy paused me, and it's OK, I had a drink. And the bartender, and he says, yeah, give him another drink. We're having another drink. I said, no, 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 have another. I don't drink two drinks. OK, I had two drinks. And I said, Martin, I, the second drink today, I've got a headache. What the hell is happening? I usually don't. He says, oh, he says, you got a, this alcohol had a high congener content. I said, what the hell is a congener? I just take an aspirin, another, I said, how do you spell that? I always put it in my pocket. 
I went home, I have an unabridged dictionary, there's no such thing as a conjurer. Okay. I get back to San Francisco, I said, I'm gonna go to the medical library, I know he's not crazy. And I learned something, okay? I'll do it as fast as I can. But anyway, if you take any carbohydrate and add yeast, you could ferment it. During the fermentation, that carbohydrate turns to alcohol. If you use sugar cane, the alcohol is called rum. If you use grapes, the alcohol is called brandy. If you use corn, the alcohol is called vodka. But it's all the same thing, the fermentation to ethyl alcohol. Nature produces a damn good ethyl alcohol. It's about 98, 99% pure ethyl alcohol with one or 2% congeners. Congeners are naturally forming impurities. Now the alcohol we drink is ethyl alcohol. The one or two percent of congeners are propyl alcohol, acid aldehyde, ethyl formate, amyl alcohol, a lot of chemical junk. And it's this chemical junk that gives bourbon or cognac its flavor. Okay, and that's very interesting. Next time I was in New York, I went back to the same restaurant. I says, give me a vodka neat. And I said, fine, I, had a little, I took one of those little airline bottles and I poured it in there and closed it. And the bartender says, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to a party, they don't drink, I just pour this into the orange juice. Ah, oh, very smart. He didn't say, why didn't you do this at home, you idiot? You know, and <laughs> instead of spending $8 for it. Anyway, so and what I did, I sent it to a lab because I wanted to find that, lo and behold, the lab report is, has a high content of amyl alcohol. I said, I now know what it is. I'm sensitive to amyl alcohol. It gives me a damn bad headache. Anyway. I know enough about chemistry to know you can't filter out these impurities. You must distill at precise temperatures to remove the fractions, okay? I have to know that, okay. As I calculated you need four distillations. And to make a long story, I, get a, I find a distiller, and I said, this is what I want, I want a vodka, but I want it to be distilled four times. And the guy said, are you crazy? You don't, we've been making alcohol have vodka for 120 years. Nobody has asked for four distillations. I said, I want it to be still four distillations. I will. He said, I, I don't know. I finally said, and this is after a couple, one guy finally said, all right, I'll do it. And he said to me, CBD. I said, CB, what? What is that? Cash before delivery. <laughs> I said, okay. And when the check clears, we'll make it for you. All right. Make a long, sent it to him, check cleared, made it, you know what I mean? And it, and it turned out, and I tweaked it with my own little tricks that I used. Uh, and I was able to get a patent for it, and then at the last moment I said, to, there, here's another interesting thing. At the last moment I said to my, uh, my, my patent attorney, I said, Michael, I don't, I, don't want the, I don't want the patent to issue. He said, why not? Is it driven? No, I don't want the patent to issue. He said, why? I said, I don't know how to protect it. If I tell other people what I'm doing, then one way or another they're gonna copy it. Go find them or what? I can't do it, okay? And that was a perfectly intelligent decision to make not to get a patent, okay? So I didn't get a patent, I kept it a secret, and I don't think to this day, they don't know exactly what I'm doing, but they know it's pure, so they're all, now every, every other guy is doing four, four distillations, eight distillations, anyway. We made a terrific vodka, and it was called Sky Vodka. And there again, name to me is very important. Uh, may I go on? Yes, as no, an example, I want you to explain as an how example, you chose as a Sky. rich, rich Russian, he spent $25 million to do a vodka that he sells in Russia, and it's called Russian Standard Vodka. Now in Russia, it works well. Give me a Russian Standard on the rock. In America, it's a stupid call. So, after 25 million, it's still not selling. There's no give me a Russian standard on the rocks. You sound like an idiot, you know? So, <laughs> and right now, it doesn't even sound The name becomes very, congenial. very important, okay? Yeah. Well, when I did Sky, I, the first name that popped in my head, I'm going to call it Prince Romanov Vodka. <laughs> I'll have a Prince Romanov on the rocks. <laughs> now, how about Tsar Nikolai Vodka? <laughs> hey, wait a minute, it's not going to be Russian, it's going to be American. So another three months went by. I was very lucky. I looked out the window. We had a beautiful blue. I said, look at that sky. You have to be lucky also. I said, that's sky vodka. I called my patent. I said, Michael, I want to register this name. What? 
Sky vodka. How do you spell it? Sky, S-K-Y. No good. He said, what do you mean no good? Too generic. That's too generic. It's like you want to register air or water? Sky? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no. This said, is public Damn. radio. Yeah. <laughs> That's on the radio. Yeah, I don't want to say that. Okay. We can they, can, bleep. they can bleep we, that. We they can, can bleep. bleep that. I mean, every movie I go to, the guys are using no, the no, F word. I know. But, I right. know. <laughs> no, not now. Not now, Maurice. Not anyway, now. Anyway, okay. Okay. Oh, God. Okay. So okay. then you said, well, just so add another said, Y. So then, well, no. Uh, then I took them two weeks. I said, Wait a minute. I'll add another Y. Yeah. It turned Perfect. out to be a blessing. Because it gave it a great look. It says, you also have to be lucky. Okay? So I said, Sky, and I went out and sold it. That was a huge success. And I put it, I said, how'd you get a blue bottle? I said, what are you going to put Sky Vodka in? A yellow bottle? I mean, you know, I'm just like, you got to be a genius to figure out to put it in a blue bottle. Okay. okay. Now, well, before we go on to oh, these yeah, questions. wonderful Look questions. We, we may be here till midnight. Yeah. No, 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 no. We're, we're just getting started, and I think it's, I think it's very sweet when you read the book that you'll see that Maurice says, you know, there's the Russian stuff, there's the Swedish stuff, but this is really going to be American vodka, and he doesn't put on it made in America. No, he says distilled in America from American grain. So, I mean, the whole thing is that really... Took, that took a couple of months. Yeah. So how can the I say is made in America? I don't okay. know. Made with pride. I don't yeah. know. But then you know, slipping to over to, to Europe, yeah. we're talking about this wonderful painter whose work you've always enjoyed, Vermeer. And you say to yourself, wow, I think if the Irish can do something, and of course I'm Irish, so, you know, but we're still good friends that the Bailey's cream you thought was kind of interesting, but you wanted to come up with something very yeah. special, with a very special chocolate. So tell us a little bit about Vermeer. Well, I, I, I was talking to some uh, people in, in Holland who were in the dairy business, and I said, you know, I want to make a chocolate cream liqueur to compete with Bailey's. I said, we can do it. No, I said, okay. And I want, Bailey's uses an Irish whiskey mm -hmm. as a base alcohol. I would be using vodka because it's cleaner. It doesn't have a whiskey taste to it. Okay. Anyway, they, we experiment this, that, do that, do that. Anyway, we made a very, very nice chocolate cream liqueur. Unfortunately, I, by that time, uh, I was too busy with Sky and didn't devote the kind of time that it deserved. Uh, it's still there. If there's anybody here that wants to sell or uh, promote uh, Vermeer, the Dutch chocolate cream liqueur, I'd be very happy to talk to him. Okay, <laughs> my number is in the phone book. Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, we we have not made that has not been a success because we it's just been ignored. But at the beginning, it looked as it though was, everything was right. very auspicious. You were wondering about whether or not enough people knew about Vermeer, and then the movie came out, and then there were exhibitions across the country, right. and you had on your label the wonderful girl with the pearl earring. Yeah, earring. that's a masterpiece oh, by Vermeer. Absolutely. It's called absolutely The Girl with the Pearl Earring, often referred to as the Dutch Mona Lisa. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And beautiful we had painting. it here just it's a last year. And it's very easy to sell. All you have to do is tasting. It takes a lot of time and work, but you go into a uh, where a liquor store and have tasting in the states that that's permitted. We get orders and get reorders, but it's been again management is key. Unless you manage it properly, I don't care what business you're in, you're gonna lose money. Okay, and it has not been managed right. Somebody should turn the air conditioner on. Yeah, you know. It's, it's gotten very warm. Okay. Okay, you can, oh, you can use one of these cards what else as, you want? A, as a fan. Okay, yeah, But okay. don't keep it near your mic. Yeah, keep it there on the right. So, people are very interested in your inventions, but are interested in knowing if there are a few inventions of other people that you think were quite, or are quite smart. There are a few that you mentioned in the book, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Like. Like who, 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 who are you talking ribs. about, huh? Like good grips. Good grips. I don't know, did I mention that? Already? Yeah. Remember? 
I don't know. My, there was a there was memory, a gentleman my memory, who's, my memory is not whose 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 wife. That's because you're on information overload I, I, I and just know. too inventive. But one of the things that Maurice mentions in the book, you know, the O X O good grips, is that the gentleman's wife had right. some sort of arthritis of the exactly. hands. Exactly, that was and, brilliant. You yeah. know, so yeah, speak to it because yeah. Oh well, look, always look at a problem and say, what can I do about it? I says, older people, they don't have the grip, whatever. So he, I said, I can put a large rubber handle on this thing, call it good grips, and he it was very successful. They made, in, in the book, I think you mentioned 850 implements within the With, family right, of good, good grips. Right, good grips, okay, I mean, he expanded it, but it based on one simple thing, an observation that many people can't hold on to it, can't, make it so that people can hold on to it, brilliant. It doesn't have to be rocket science to be successful. So a question here that you actually answer in some detail in your book, but to uh, whet the appetite of people, what is the difference between an inventor who has a great idea and goes nowhere and a successful entrepreneur? Okay, well, I, I use as an example for that, John and Mary are driving and it's drizzling. This is 15 years ago. He turns the wiper on, turns it off, turns the wiper on, turns He says, Mary, you know what they should have? You should have a button, press a button, and you'd have an intermittent wiper. Wouldn't that be a great invention? Oh, John, great invention. Okay. 10 years later, he buys a car, and lo and behold, it has an intermittent wiping. Turn, intermittent wiping. And he says, Mary, didn't I invent that? I said, no, you didn't invent it. You've got to go one step further. A lot of people have a good idea, but they don't carry through with the idea. So I'm saying, you have to think and say, what can I do? Now you say, but I'm mechanically in, incapable of doing this. Find somebody who's mechanically capable and say, Jack, I want you to design a wiper that works you know, intermittently. And you can find that person. It's not rocket science. And you have an adventure. And the guy that... Uh, that happens to be an interesting story because the guy that did invent that ended up collecting millions of dollars from General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. Uh, this is very interesting. He invented a mechanical system using what is known as a cam to do this, okay? When General Motors and Ford and Chrysler made an intimate wiper, they used it electronically, very different. And they could have <clears throat> not only just intermittent, <coughs> excuse me, but variable intermittent. It could be this, this, or it could be, you know. Was, I don't think that they infringed on the man's patent. He had to make that. But the, the jury awarded him millions of dollars, okay? So, but the point is that if you have an idea like that, carry it, go a step further, go. You know, look, you might have an idea, look here, post-it note, you say, gee, I hate this, I hate this pad, how do I, what can I do? I, all I said was, put it on a roll, okay? And look, put it on a roll, now, how do I find this adhesive, right? Oh, it's a big deal. No, I don't know if you've seen it, but very often you get a letter and there's a strip with a barcode on it, take that strip off, put it, it's got a removable, adhesive that you can place any place else? Who did I call? I called the guys that make that to the post office. I said, can you make, can you make a roll for me? Oh yeah, you pay for it, we'll make it, you know? So there it is, and there's the roll. As you can see, the, the radio audience can't see, but it's nothing to it, it's a roll. I want it three inches so that I can call, see, press the, whoops. See, press this. Now you've got a three by three note. Easy as pie, okay? So, again, you've got to think about it. Where do you find a guy to make this adhesive? Oh, because 3M says, we're, we're geniuses. That's why we made this adhesive. Well, there are other geniuses out there, you know? They're not the only geniuses. Anyway, there it is. What's the next question? Okay, and I just... I just returned from St. Paul, so this is really very connected. Do you think it's more complicated, more difficult for a new idea to take off today in a more populous, high-tech age? 
Well, I'm very sorry that I'm not 30 years old, because if I was, I don't know, I, I looked at Watts app was sold, and the guy got $19 billion. I couldn't believe it. I still don't understand it, OK? So I'm sure that if I were 30 years old, I would figure out something with some app or something. I'm not saying I get 19 billion, but I get 100 million for an app, OK? So I feel deprived and out of the loop, <laughs> OK? Because I, I, I don't know that. I think. So in, in the book, just uh, for example, the description you give of all of the extraordinary features that can be developed with 3D printing. Well, first, number one, I'm very, I'm very cautious about words. Does everybody here know what a 3D printer is? Okay. A lot the of, audience, okay. for those who it, can't that's, see, that's the wrong tend to be nodding their heads. It is not a 3D printer. It is a 3D model maker, not a printer. I mean, you ask so, so what's a 3D? It prints 3D? You know, you know, it's a 3D model maker. I don't get into how it works, but brilliant. You know, I, mean, I love it. We have it. I mean, I have a 3D printer in the office, you know, so that if we want to make a little model, we can make it. It's beautiful. Okay. People want to know what you're inventing now. I well, there's one invention I, I, I can't even talk about, and I think I mentioned that to you. <laughs> okay. Well, just uh, know that, that Maurice but, is you know, still there, at there's, it. There's always, there's, there's always a look. Here, I've invented something that I will not make a penny, and I, be, I hope to do some good. I was reading where, in the third world, there are a lot of people that are myopic, nearsighted. You show them like, e, okay. They can't afford a pair of glasses. Whatnot. I'm sorry I didn't bring them here. No, they're wonderful. Yeah. So I made a strip with two, three, four, five diopters. That's the strength of the lens. So, OK, you say, Mr. Galabucci, look at the E, right? Oh, I see the next one. Oh, I see that. I see the last one. No, no, that one. No, this one. OK. So we know in the left eye, three diopters. The right eye, four diopters. Here's a pair of glasses. The guy can now see, OK? And it's virtually to his prescription, OK? Because the left eye maybe need a higher diopter. The right eye, what does it cost? 85 cents with the lenses. And we've given away over 50,000, but I'm hope I'm trying to get, if anybody here knows Gates, we can give it to him. I'd be very happy to get help. All I'm going to do is give them the, I pay, the molds are all paid for. So you, I'll give you the guy in China, and you can order the glasses, whatever you want. There's a kit that we make with the lenses and the frame. Mm -hmm. And you're in business, and it's very easy to pop the lens in the mm -hmm. frame. And it's a, you know, I call it the Sigmund Freud frame. There are two round discs, or the Albert Einstein. Years ago, they all wore these simple round uh, <laughs> glasses. Like your friend Bernard. Huh? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. How do you know your inventions have not been invented before? You don't know. What you have to do is what is known as a search, a patent search. Today, with the computer, you can get an awful lot of information in the computer and say, oh, somebody has invented this, right? OK? So you don't have to spend a lot of money for legal fees. Mm -hmm. Which is smart and which you wouldn't want to do. What have you enjoyed most about your work? And what have you enjoyed least? Well, of course, the successful inventions are always very pleasurable, <laughs> OK? 80-20 uh, cola was, uh, I thought, a disaster. Okay. I did. A, I made a mistake, and I just there it is. I wrote the check out, and it was a loss. Okay, but again, you can't you can't be discouraged to the point where you stop working. You know, so you still keep thinking. And I've done a number of things after that. You know. What do you think about some of these crowdfunding sources like Kickstarter for people who want to uh, bring inventions forward? Well, you know, again. I, the first thing you have to do is think, get upset if it doesn't work right, okay? Whatever you do. The young kids today can say, what, what upsets you about your iPad, you know? If it upsets you, say, how can I do it better? Or what could I do to make it better, okay? And then there's a chance that you can make it better and get a patent and also be able to make a lot of money without having a nine-to-five job. 
Is that more or less answer? If I'm not answering it fully, let's repeat the question on that. <laughs> no, no, you did. What? There are, some, there are a number of questions, but they all go back to this. And you've answered, but I think it's, it's worth addressing it again. What motivates you? What has led to your being this inventive well, person? I really think you're born with it, OK? I, I don't think you could make it, but I think you're born with it. And I was saying, I think, to somebody just the other, an hour ago or so, I said, you know what? If you want to check a two-year-old's IQ, you can't ask them questions, OK? But you check their curiosity. And the more curious that child is, the higher his IQ, because he's going to learn more. Now, a lot of s smart people understand a lot of what's going on. But most people don't care about making an improvement. I get very frustrated. I say, well, I'm a perfect example. I get the last pad, three sheets, and I couldn't separate it. I said, there's got to be a better way than a pad. And I put it on a roll, OK? And it's not, once you see it, well, no, it's not rocket science. But you have to think about it. Okay, and yeah, it's um, there's a need. There's a need. Oh, look, I, I would say the invention that I'm most proud of, which you haven't asked me, right? But I will. Tell no, you. but it's here. I'm. Uh, is it in you're there? You're anticipating. Oh, okay. Maurice. All right. Well, you're anticipating. Ask me and I'll tell you. Okay. All right, but I'm just going. <laughs> all right, but I'm just going to take one second to remind people who may have just turned in to uh, tuned into the radio program that you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California. Today, our guest is noted inventor and philanthropist Maurice Canbar. I'm Mary Bitterman. You can also find video of Commonwealth Club programs online at the club's YouTube channel. So, what are you the most proud of, you know, well, The Maurice? invention I, that I'm most proud of, <clears throat> 20 years ago, the same, the same internist, who's a dear friend, the same internist that told me about congeners, <laughs> said to me, calls me up and says to me, you know, Maurice, let me tell you something. Last year, there were 20,000 accidental needle sticks. Yes. OK? I yes, said, this really? is so 20, important. 000? He says, yes, in hospitals, clinics, and whatnot. And he says, you know, if you're dealing with a patient with AIDS or hepatitis, you now have it. It's that easy, OK? And this is terrible. You got, you know, you got HIV. You're in big trouble. If not, you go go into heaven, right? So he said, we have to invent something to protect the hospital. I said, all right, Martin, I'll think about it. But I must say, he persisted and called me every month. I said, all right, let me think about this. This is terrible because, you know, twenty thousand accidental needle sticks. Now, first, how does this happen? You know Murphy's law, right? Do you know Schultz's law? How many people here know Schultz's law? Nobody. Schultz's law is that Murphy's law is optimistic. <laughs> OK? That's how it happens, OK? Anyway, so I thought about it, thought about it. <coughs> and I said, wait a minute. I, damn it, I got it. The long little thing that I did, very, when you see it, it's very simple. It's known as an eccentric hole on a little disc. Anyway, to make a long story short, invented it got a patent, went to Beckton Dickinson. They said, whoa, this is great. Anyway, to make a long story, it made millions of dollars in royalties, OK? I don't know what Beckton Dickinson made, hundreds of millions of dollars. As a matter of fact, I think we, I just spoke to Martin a few hours ago. I think we're down to the, I think this, we've got one more payment of royalties to go, OK? And then my patent expires, because patents don't last forever. and. Uh, there it is, it's gone. But why am I proud of that? <clears throat> if that prevented one person from getting AIDS and dying, if it saved one life, it's a great thing because in Judaism we have, he who saves one life saves the world. So that I'm most proud of. Forget about the money it made. I mean, it all got to charity for me anyway. And I gave him 25% of the royalty, so he was very, very happy. But anyway, it may have saved one life. I'm delighted. And many more than that. <laughs> there's one other um, 
invention that I think is really quite wonderful. Um, and it's because people are becoming, you know, more interested in eating well. You know, it goes back to, you know, the old Tiny Tim thing yeah. about you are yeah. what you eat and the rest of it. Why don't you just say a word about the evening that you went and had dinner and you said, well, this looks good, except the problem is it's white rice and this is all going to turn into sugar and I want to be well. And yeah. So tell us that story because it's really well, no, wonderful. Well, actually, about I, I, have, I have some cousins who live in Panama and they came to visit me in San Francisco and Henry's wife, Frida, decided to make me a dish. She said, you got to try this dish, very popular in the Middle East. I said, okay. I said, what is it? It's white rice and lentils. Mm -hmm. Very popular Middle East. Okay. Uh, I said, I won't eat this. He said, why not? I said, I don't eat white rice. But I said, well, give me the recipe, blah, blah. So gives me, tells me, I said, okay. I went out and bought brown rice and made it too with brown rice. I'm free to taste this. Oh, this is much better. I'll never use white rice again. So again, sometimes you've got to demonstrate to get something that, to click. If I just tell her, use brown rice, she says, oh, okay. But I said, no, I'll make it with brown rice. Now you can taste it with it. And being an experimenter, I kept experimenting. And we made a product, I made a product which I call Sufu, which is super food. It's sold in Whole Foods, mm -hmm. Molly Stones. I mean, it, it, we have not had one supermarket refuse to put it on. It's got nine grains, but the interesting thing is there's not one rice recipe that I know that uses whole wheat berries in the formula. We use whole wheat berries and we use whole rye berries. And it gives it a crunch. It, I think it's a delicious food. It's available at Whole Foods. It's called Sufu, S-O-O-F-O-O, -O -O, for super food. And it's terrific, high protein, you know, all the rest of that. And it's organic, okay? No pesticides, no, no, uh, you know, what are they, the modification? The yeah, chemical genetic modification. modification. Genetic, it's, it's very good food. Anyway, it's available and uh, it's healthy. And I like things that are healthy and delicious. So, and if you want to serve it for breakfast for your kids, put add some maple syrup, syrup or brown yeah. sugar. Kids want it sweet. And it's a hell of a lot better than Cheerios. And a lot better for the kids than Cheerios. So, and has Frida begun? Because she could be your agent in Panama for the sale of ah. Sufu. I hope so. Yeah. She no, but sold I think one package in Panama. But okay. <laughs> but but I I think what's interesting because it's not just the invention of things, but it's carrying through the entire process. As I recall from the book, you actually went to different markets. You had people trying it, so that you had people. No, well, I hired a person yeah. to go sell it. I said, how are you going to sell this? I will show the buyer. This is a great, uh, it's got nine grains, and it has protein, and it has its organic. I said, that's it? Yeah, I think, I think I'll buy it. I says, no. I said, I want you to buy a wide mouth thermos. I want you to cook it in the morning, take it to the buyer, and say, here it is. It's got all this protein. I said, but I want you to taste it, Mr. Buyer. Open the can, have the little paper cup, put it in there, and taste it. Oh, oh, yeah, we'll put it in. Okay? It's as simple as doing that, which changes the whole picture. Exactly. Okay? Because you just show it and talk, and say, yeah, or we'll think about it. Goodbye. Let him taste it. And we'd like to have tastings. And we have tastings, and people, oh, yeah, I'll take it. Okay, I'll, yeah. Ted Danson was there. He said, oh, Mr. Danson. No, oh, no, no. No, please, just say, oh, all right, I'll take it. Oh, oh, I'll take two packs, you know. And then again, it's all based on management. So I say to the guys, all right, I said, Mrs. Jones buys a, a Sufu. Now what? What happened? Oh, we say, thank you very much, Mrs. Jones. I says, are you crazy? First of all, you have a little brochure and say, Madam, we would like your input. If you have recipes, if you've added strawberries or chicken liver or whatever, we want to hear from you. Get involved, okay? Tell your friends about it, you know. You morons. I mean, if I tell you, I'm, some, 
Sometimes I think I'm surrounded by idiots, but anyway. No, I'm... no, no, you never, no, 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 Maurice. No, it's, it's interesting true. in the um, in the the back of what? the book when you're talking about social media and all and and noting that you know inventions like Facebook can be very helpful because you can have people go yep. and post recipes and get into little Correct. competitions in the rest terrific. of the terrific. Yes. Okay, so some people want to know since they know you're a very successful inventor, uh, if people come to you with inventions that they'd like you to back. How do you uh, respond? Well, again, if somebody thinks he has something that is an invention, I mean, it could be 15 years old, go on the web and check to see if there's such an invention out there. Describe your invention. I mean, I think any 15-year-old can do this for you. So then you can say, well, there's no such invention, okay, applied for or issued. Now, you say, what do you do now? Make a model of it. Don't just tell me I want to do this. Show me what, show me what's that. With today, you've got 3D printing or 3D model making. You can have something made for very little money to show what it is. It could be a, a new towel, a towel holder. I don't know, whatever it is. Try to make a sample. Try to say, now this, if we can produce this commercially, I know this will sell a model. Okay. And of course, apply for a patent. So somebody wants to know, and I, I, I don't, let me just raise the question. What do you think of Tesla's releasing its patents? Well, first, in, the, in terms of the, it's not, look, you say Tesla or electric cars running, no pollution. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You've got to manufacture electricity. And in order to manufacture, most of the electricity manufactured is still using coal. And that puts a lot of carbon dioxide in the air. So I say, Mr. Musk, Elon Musk, I said, this doesn't come without pollution. Yeah, riding the car in the city does not create pollution, but somebody's got to create the electricity. Oh, we're going to use solar panels. Well, you have to have a whole lot of solar panels if you've got a thousand cars. Okay, you've got acres and acres of, so it's not that easy. I am praying that we are able to harness the power of fusion Right now, any of the atomic plants are doing fission, which produces radioactive waste. If we had fusion, there would be no radioactive waste, and we could produce huge quantities of electricity, okay? And it would change the world, because what we would do is take that electricity and put it into water and disassociate H2O into H and O. The O we let go, the hydrogen we put into cylinders, that will run a car with a $400 conversion, hydrogen will run a car, and when the hydrogen burns, what do we get? Water vapor, okay, fabulous. I hope it happens tomorrow, okay? Right now, we have not yet been able to control a fusion reaction so that we can create heat to make steam, to run generators, to create electricity. And I'm praying that happens. You know, we've reached the point in the program where there's time for only one last question. And so many people have noted that you've been this wonderful, successful inventor, but that you are also a very committed philanthropist. Okay. And I'd like you to just say a word about how you feel about this. Your brother Elliot said you should stop working because, yeah. you know, what are you working to for? To do what? What are you working for? And your response is, you know, I'm not working to make money because everything I make, I it's give going, away. Yeah. But I think part of that stems from your wonderful background, your family, tradition, well, you know, and... And repairing the world. Well, I, 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 I grew up with, you know, there's more on your plate than you can consume. Find someone who's hungry, okay? And I'm saying, here the poor people can't get eyeglasses. Well, now you're for 85 cents. Look, I can see. Or a 10-year-old at school, I can't see the blackboard. Oh, my God, I can see. And it's so simple. You know, it's not rocket science and so inexpensive. So if I could do something that does good, I'm delighted, you know. 
uh, look, my, both my parents died of heart attack. They never suffered like cancer. They, they died in their sleep, okay? So I said, I, I'm, nothing would please me more if people made some tremendous advances in cardiac problems and also had treatment and whatnot. So I'd give money to the you know, cardiac center, heart center. Uh, I, I give a lot of money for research, for instance, the one research product that I hope will succeed, they're doing research and trying to create a superconductor. I said, what the hell is a superconductor? Who needs it? Well, it's very simple. It's not complicated. <clears throat> if we generate electricity in Los Angeles and then send it to San Francisco, by the time it gets here, we've lost at least 25% of the electricity in the transportation because the conductor is not a superconductor. But if we had a superconductor where you can transport electricity through a conductor without losses, we could generate electricity in Victoria Falls and send it to Europe. Again, it would change the world. And at night in New York, where, you know, they would send it here, it's still daylight, you know, where, so you, different uh, time zones. Anyway, it would change the world. So I support that. And I'm making some progress. Okay? They're, they're not even using metal now. They've got a nylon cord that looks like uh, a tennis string, nylon tennis string, you know, but they've impacted it with microscopic nanoparticles of carbon, and it's conducting. It is not a superconductor. But it's conducting. With progress. And we're waiting for a miracle. It's like, people don't know this, but 1947, three guys at Bell Labs were fooling around with a disk of silicone. And it was a non-conductor. OK. And uh, one of them said, well, let's try to pass a current across the, you know, they pass a small current. Ah, it became a conductor. They're in the name semiconductor. Okay? Then there goes the transistor. It changed the world. Now, I understand the transistor. What I don't understand is how in God's name can you put two million transistors on a half-inch chip? Mind-boggling. So I don't understand everything, OK? All right. <laughs> Let me just how say, the hell ladies and gentlemen, I don't know. we express deep appreciation to our guest, Maurice Canbar, inventor, philanthropist, and author of the newly updated version of his 2001 book, Secrets from an Inventor's Notebook. We thank our audiences here and on the radio, television, and internet. Let me remind those of you here this evening that copies of Maurice's book are on sale in the lobby, and he'll be pleased to sign books outside this room immediately following the program. We'd also appreciate your letting him go down this aisle uh, so that he can make his way to the signing table as quickly as possible. I'm Mary Bitterman, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place to be in the know, is adjourned. Okay.